Good afternoon and welcome to this evidence session from the Committee on Standards in Public Life. The committee was established after the report of Lord Nolan uh, into public standards and our job is to advise the Prime Minister and the government of the day on the processes and procedures for maintaining and upholding public standards across the whole of public life. We're very pleased in this session to have as our witness uh, Commissioner Dion, who is the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner of Canada. So a very interesting comparison with the British system. Uh, and from our committee point of view, we have uh, with us this afternoon, uh, Dame, independent members, Dame Shirley Pierce, uh, Manisha Shah and Dr. Jane Martin, and one of our political members, uh, Lord Stunnell from the Liberal Democrats. Uh, just by way of uh, explanation for anybody who has not seen any of these other sessions, uh, in the, the 25th anniversary of the first Nolan report, the committee uh, commissioned some academic research into the tapestry of standards bodies uh, that have grown up over many years in the UK. Uh, and on the, on the back of that work, we have undertaken this inquiry which is to look at whether that overall uh, pattern of standards bodies is working effectively, uh, looking for areas where there need to be recommendations for improvement, and also areas where there is best, best practice. Uh, we are not going to be looking at specific cases in the course of the evidence taking, uh, and of course we are not uh, going to be taking any evidence relating to cases that are in front of the courts, uh, but this is an opportunity for some wider understanding of the comparative arrangements in Canada. So I think without more ado, can I welcome you to our session this afternoon, Commissioner Dion. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, what I'd like to ask uh, as a first question is that we understand that as Commissioner, you administer the Conflict of Interest Act for public office holders and the Conflict of Interest Code for members of the House of Commons. Could you describe your role and how it works in practice, please? Thank you very much, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for inviting me. <clears throat> so I've been in the current position for three and a half years. I now have a reasonable understanding of uh, <clears throat> the reality of what we do, the evolving reality of what we do. Uh, so. The chair has already mentioned that we have two instruments, one governing the conduct of members of parliament while they are members of parliament and only while they are members of parliament. It has no uh, impact after they leave public office. And the Conflict of Interest Act, which uh, on, on, uh, on, 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 on its side applies to 2,800 public office holders, people who are appointed as opposed to elected. More than half of those uh, public office holders are only subject to the Act's core set of conflict of interest because they are part-timers. And uh, so they're only subject to a few of the core rules, but not to all the rules. Reporting public office holders include uh, ministers. So ministers in Canada, all ministers at this point in time, although constitutionally it's possible to be a minister without being an MP, but all ministers are also MP. So they're governed by both the code and the Act as well as parliamentary secretaries. The Act also governs ministerial staff, people, political people who work in each minister's office. We have uh, 15, 20 people in each minister's office who, uh, who are appointed to serve the ministers and to governor and council appointees. So people appointed by the government, such as deputy ministers, heads of crown corporations, and full-time members of federal boards, tribunals, etc., etc. So our role is to, it's threefold essentially. We provide advice, and that's the lion's share of what we do. So MPs and public office holders who wish to get advice, uh, are, uh, we're accessible to them and we provide thousands of pieces of advice each year. And we provide advice in writing and when provided advice constitutes a protection for them in the sense that to the uh, they should not be blamed if they have divulged all the facts, of course, should not be blamed for having done something after they've consulted with us and we said it was appropriate under the rules. So that's the first thing we do. 
The second uh, we do is we administer the, the mechanics of uh, the code and the act. So the public disclosures, when, when first elected, when first appointed, uh, the people have to uh, file a, a confidential statement in which they disclose their assets and their liabilities. And they're asked each year to uh, update the information and they have an ongoing obligation to inform us of any significant change to their assets and liabilities. So that's, we do that. And that's also an important part of what we do. But the most visible part of the iceberg, of course, is investigations. So under both the code and the act, as commissioner, I have the power to launch an investigation when an allegation is made by a member of parliament that a colleague has contravened the code or that a public official has contravened the act. I can also, on my own volition, start an investigation. So we, uh, we do that uh, each year. We have, uh, on a, at any given point in time, we have uh, five to 10 investigations ongoing. And uh, the, the purpose of those investigations is to uh, determine, to provide the, the view, my view, as to whether the act or the code has been breached and to do so in a way that respects the principles of fundamental justice, of course, each interview is done under oath, a transcript is taken, and uh, at the end of the process, I basically uh, write a report in which I share my conclusions with the Speaker of the House of Commons, and in the case of an MP whose conduct has been reviewed, or with the Prime Minister in the case of public officials under the Conflict of Interest Act. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's essentially what we do. Uh, on an ongoing basis with a staff of uh, 50 people and a budget of uh, approximately 4.5 million euros. Thank you very much. Could I... I'm into sorry. Pounds. sorry, I did not uh, translate into sterling pounds. I don't know. You still use the euro, do you? Or, oh, I'm sorry. No, we, no, we've never used the euro, but I think we never. understand the euro value. Okay. So that... okay. <laughs> That's um, good. Could I, could I clarify a couple of the points that you made? Am I, would I be right in saying that your focus is specifically on conduct, on conflict of interest issues rather than any wider ethical uh, rules for members of parliament or for public officials? The, um, yeah, so on, on my, my, my title bears the word ethics, but it's quite limited. My role is limited in terms of the number of instances where uh, I, uh, I do anything other than look at potential conflicts of interest. Uh, the Act gives me the, uh, gives me the authority, the obligation to provide advice to the Prime Minister on a wide range of ethical issues when, when it is sought from me or on my own volition. But apart from that, everything we do is related directly to conflicts of interest under the classical definition, a clash between official duties and somebody's private interests. And that is financial only or more wider conflicts? Financial only. Thank you. But written uh, large. So in other words, somebody who pursues a public office, for instance, uh, do so, does so for political reasons, but there's also a financial impact if you get elected. And we do consider these, these uh, efforts to be governed by the act as well, conflict of interest. Thank you. And you said that where there is a conflict of interest which relates to a member of parliament, that that is reported to the speaker. Is there any difference for a member of parliament who is also a minister? Does that go to the prime minister or does that go to the speaker? It does depend on whether the alleged conduct took place qua MP or as a minister. So, Because ministers still have responsibilities in their own constituencies. So if the act initially relates to a function as an MP, then it would be under the code, irrespective of the fact that they are also a minister. If the act clearly relates to ministerial duties, then it will only be investigated under the act and reported to the prime minister under the act. So do you have uh, other regulatory bodies or commissioners who are looking at sort of behavioral issues or other uh, conduct related issues in parallel to the work that you're, uh, you, you do as commissioner? 
Yes, so there are parallel bodies. I'm thinking about the uh, the uh, Board of Internal Economy, which it's a committee of uh, MPs, basically, regulating the use made of resources by members of parliament, public resources made available to them. That's one example of another body which uh, intersects somewhat with what we do. And in the case of public officials, there are also other bodies that would look at issues having to do with, uh, for, for instance, uh, allegations of uh, professional or sexual harassment. So that's completely outside of my mandate, but it yeah. does with the conduct of a public official. So that's another example. Thank you. Um, in the UK, we have uh, the seven principles of public life, which act as an overarching statement of the standards that those in public life are expected to meet, whether they are political or or, or public officials, uh, and then also, of course, a, a series of codes of conduct and so on in various institutions. Can you tell us the, the, the extent to which within the Canadian system, this is a rules-based uh, regulatory framework or is it a principles-based regulatory framework? I'm afraid I was about to answer as a, as a good Canadian, you know, it's somewhere in between. Uh, <laughs> Compromise position was taken. Each of the code and the act contains a long preamble setting out the principles on which the rules are based. But in actual life, uh, we use the principles to interpret the rules, but something does not infringe the code unless, of course, it breaches a rule, even though it might be in conflict with the principle, uh, if you follow me. So uh, they, they're useful. It's very important to understand the principles because they are foundational to both the code and the act. Uh, but I'm afraid that in the day-to-day -day work, we basically pay much more attention to the specific rules that may have been breached. I understand. And also in the UK system, for a variety of reasons, uh, standards um, arrangements rest on a mixture of uh, rules and conventions, uh, so there is a limit to, it, to the extent to which there is hard enforcement of conventions, but they actually play quite an important part in our standards arrangements. Could you tell us within the Canadian model whether there is a similar balance between con convention and rule and law, or whether you have a different approach? There is not much by way of that conventions that I'm aware of, which are applicable to the sphere you know, that we're looking at on conflicts of interest. So it's largely governed by the rules and only by the rules. Uh, but I failed to mention earlier to one of our, your earlier questions that, of course, there are provisions as well in the criminal code. Canada did codify its criminal law back in 19, 1895. Sorry. Um, and there are a few sections in the code that do relate to uh, improper conduct in the, in the subject area of conflict of interest as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass over to Dr. Martin to uh, ask some further questions, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jonathan. And, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Dion, for, for being with us. Um, I, I'd uh, like to ask you about the advantages and disadvantages that you see of your role. Uh, I mean, we, we are aware that we have a very complex web of organisations regulating uh, interests, conflicts of interest, behaviour across the Westminster system. Um, and whilst there are clearly a number of bodies also in the Canadian system, uh, your particular role seems to be uh, very clear um, uh, and, and easily understood, if I can put it that way. So we'd like to learn from you about that. And could you give us your view of then of the advantages and disadvantages of, of the responsibility you have for your body? Thank you. It's not, the, it's not an easy question. The, the former <laughs> ones were easy either, but this one is a little bit more difficult. So... Um, there is a, the focus is clear that uh, at the federal level, Canada is a federation, as you know, um, at the federal level, uh, if you are a member of parliament, there is a single instrument, the code, governing the conduct of co the, co the conflict of interest code for members of the House of Commons. Of course, as well as the criminal code, as I have mentioned, of course. Uh, so the focus is clear. 
the role of the commissioner is clearly defined in the code itself. My role is to help administer the code, period. So I don't, I'm not in charge of the code. I did not draft the code. I will not amend the code. The code was created by members of the house back in 2004, has been amended on a few occasions since then, and it's part of the standing orders. And my role is to help, to assist, to help in administering the code. Uh, so it's clear, the, the focus is extremely clear. Uh, on the conflict of interest act side, same thing. The role of the commissioner is spelt out. I, I, know, I only have the authority that the act gives me. I have no inherent jurisdiction because I'm not a court. Uh, all I can do is uh, what the act authorizes me to do. But again, as uh, I answered in a, in a former question, in matters related to conflict of interest, I have exclusive jurisdiction at the federal level for the people who are clearly spelt out as being governed, you know, government appointments by the governor and council itself and members of ministerial staff and minister's office. And so not, and, and it's not the run of the mill public service. It's uh, the top echelons, if you wish, of the public service. So the act clearly defines who's governed. The act defines my role very clearly uh, in that it gives me a series of authorities, including the power to investigate. And in each, in both cases, I have not said that up until now, but in both cases, I have no authority to punish anyone, to impose a sanction as a result of a contravention of a substantive provision of the code or the act. Only the House of Commons can do that for MPs. Mm -hmm. I can recommend sanction. Uh, the code says that very clearly, that it expects the commissioner to recommend a sanction. Uh, but then the act says, basically, I have to let the prime minister know in my report uh, whether I consider that the act has been contravened based on my analysis of the facts. The act does not even suggest that I have any power to even recommend the sanction. But the act says that abiding by the Conflict of Interest Act is a condition of employment. So the prime minister, when he gets a report from me saying that the senior official has breached the Conflict of Interest Act, has to ask himself the question whether this is sufficient to revoke the appointment or to impose a penalty of, uh, of any kind. So I think it's, it's clear. Uh, people would know where to go for advice. They know, they know who will conduct an investigation if something is alleged. They also know who can make a complaint. It's restricted. Only MPs, members of parliament, and senators can, uh, can make a complaint to me under the act and under the code, it's only MPs. But I can investigate matters on my own volition if I have reasonable grounds to believe out of media reports, social media, anything that is solid enough to justify reasonable grounds. Sure, thank you. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, that does all sound very clear and I'm sure that is a great benefit to you in your work. Um, but you are, of course, working in a political um, environment. Uh, you are, you're looking into the standards of, um, you know, officials and elected members. So um, do you get any challenges from that environment? Do you find that you have the trust of politicians? Do you find that, uh, there are any problems with partisan politics that affect the way you work? So do I have the trust of politicians? I'm, I'm sure that I do not have the trust universally of every politician every time. It's, it's, it's not possible. It takes a long time to establish credibility. Uh, the office has been in place for uh, 17 years, for, sorry, 14 years. Uh, myself, I've been there three and a half years. I think most politicians respect our work. Some don't, and that's fine. Um, that's fine. It's to be expected, and we're working. And it's not a popularity contest either. My role is to make independent decisions in a uh, rational, fact-based, fact-based uh, approach, basically, in keeping with the law. And uh, sometimes, when a decision comes out, you have people who are. In agreement, and you are people who disagree with the uh, the report. That will always be that way. Uh, I have not, in the three and a half years, felt that on any occasion any pressure of a political nature. I should maybe mention that uh, point one: I'm appointed after forty years of service in the public sector, so I have a 
probably a bio biological in independence of mine somewhat because <laughs> of my tenure and uh, the fact that I do not expect to be in the public sector for the next 40 years. <laughs> and uh, I'm immovable as well. So I'm appointed for seven years. Yeah. Uh, my appointment cannot be revoked unless there is excellent cause and it would require a resolution in the House of Commons to remove me from my position. So it's not a popularity contest. I try to, to act honestly uh, in keeping with the rights of individuals involved to share my, to come to a conclusion as to whether somebody has breached, not breached. And uh, I feel independent. It's, uh, it's easy for me to feel independent because of my background at, at the Department of Justice, among other places and because also of uh, the conditions of my appointment. Thank you very much indeed. That's really very helpful. I think Dame Shirley, you're, you've got some questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yes, Commissioner Dion, thank you very much. Very interesting. And there seems to be a, a very uh, welcome clarity about your role, which we, we don't see in all of our parts of the standards landscape in the UK. So we're keen, we're keen to learn. Um, you've given a very clear um, exposition of, of, of how you go about your work. That's that's really helpful. Just to give me a little bit of uh, a sense of whether I have grasped what's in and what's out. Um, it's financial conflict of interest. So does lobbying fit in there um, if there's not an immediate transfer of resource? If it's, is it, where, where would lobbying and links with the business sector um, fit in here? So the act, uh, the act prohibits anybody from giving some somebody preferential treatment based on the fact on the person who makes representations to them. So if you're a minister, for instance, you happen to know somebody who approaches you, it is prohibited for you to be influenced by the fact uh, that the person is represented by somebody you like or a friend or somebody you've previously worked with. You would have to recuse yourself. Basically, uh, you could not pr proceed any further. That's one example of a clear substantive provision in the Act which prohibits um, interface between a public office holder, i.e. a minister in this example, and a corporation on the basis of who represents the corporation. There is a distinct lobbying act in Canada at the federal level, and there is a distinct lobbying commissioner who is responsible for the implementation of the lobbying act, the system of registration and report of lobbying activities. So she maintains a registry of 6,200 uh, lobbyists at this point in time, who uh, must each month report any dealing that they have had with anyone, <laughs> any senior public servant at the federal level. Uh, there is a legal obligation to report any such meeting and it's published also in the public registry accessible through, accessible through the web. Uh, so we have two distinct jurisdictions, lobby, there's a, there is an interface, of course, between conflicts of interest and lobbying, but it's regulated in a separate act, basically called the Lobbying Act. Okay, and, and does that overlap ever produce uh, obstacles for you or t tensions for you? From time to time, we have, uh, let's say, uh, somewhat Byzantine situations uh, where we, Nancy Belanger, my counterpart, and I have to uh, come to some common definition about how the interface should take place. Uh, it's difficult for us because everything we do is confidential, so she is under strict confidentiality requirements, and so am I. So we have to talk in the abstract without mentioning any particular situation or person but we we will we have had those discussions about interface points between the two statutes to again try to um, apply the solution that's more in line with the, the the principles that we were talking about earlier what is the most the most appropriate solution considering the underlying principles that we're trying to uh, uphold uh, and we usually find find a solution uh, these statutes are relatively recent when they are next to be reviewed by Parliament. Uh, we will address those situations so that we get a clearer interface if possible in the future. And you know what you need, you want, you know what, how you want that to come out. It's, it's, we have a little list of uh, little, uh, little things that would uh, gain from being clarified. Yeah. And are there other areas of interface with other bits of the standard um, landscape or other obstacles to you? 
doing your role as well as you'd like? No, I think it's it's all manageable. The act works as it is. The code works. Uh, it's entirely workable. It's uh, I keep an evergreen list of uh, potential amendments so that when the window of opportunity presents itself, uh, I will have some concrete proposals to make. But until then, it's it's working. It is working well. Thank you. So um, just uh, m moving a bit more onto the nature of your independence, you are uh, you report to Parliament. You're part of yeah. the, the legislature. Parliament. Um, yeah. Is there um, a, a, any blurring of responsibilities or challenges that come from the fact that you are answerable to the legislature and the and the, the executive that you are overseeing? I mean, in in in. The UK, we worry about that blurring of um, boundaries. And I just wondered how that works for you. I only answer to the uh, legislative when you think about it, because I'm an officer of the House of Commons. So even when I perform my duties under the Conflict of Interest Act, I remain an officer of the House of Commons. My report is given to the Prime Minister. It's made public immediately at the same time. Uh, but it's it's still uh, it's still before Parliament that uh, I account. I have never been called to account to any member of the executive or any body of the executive. I've never seen cabinet. I've never met the prime minister to account for anything. Uh, so again, in theory, there could be some difficulty arising out of that. But in practice, there has not been a single instance of a conflict. And the fact that the ownership of the um, rules, as it were, is, is with Parliament. Um, Parliament, the, this, the unique source is Parliament. Uh, in our case, there is a distinction when we talk about the, the code is House of Commons only. Senate has no role to play vis-a-vis -vis the, the establishment of the code. And the act has to be adopted in Canada, of course, by both the House of Commons and the Senate. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Lord Stunnell, who has direct experience of being a, a, a minister in the UK government. Okay, thank you. Andrew, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. I, I hope that's improved the situation. Good afternoon. Yeah, I, I apologize, Commissioner. Uh, uh, yes, in, in uh, before reaching the House of Lords, I served time in the House of Commons as well. And there is always great sensitivity about outside regulators or experts passing judgment on members of Parliament and huge sensitivity about what we describe in the UK as the sovereignty of Parliament and its uh, unique capacity to take decisions about itself. And this has led us into some quite difficult territory. Uh, have you found that a restriction that you face? And if so, how do you see a way around it? It's always at the back of my mind, you know, that the House of Commons is a self-regulating body, that I'm only a, an officer of Parliament. I'm there to assist in implementing the code. But at the end of the day, the House regulates itself. So um, every word I use in every report I make, I always have to bear that in mind, that I have no authority whatsoever over members of parliament. I'm only there to give them advice as to how to stay out of trouble from the conflict of interest point of view and to investigate their conduct should uh, anybody allege and should I have reasonable grounds to believe that they've contravened the code. Uh, but, uh, and I have no... Uh, no illusion that I can decide in any way, shape or form the fate of a member of parliament. That's for the house itself to determine. So once you've, uh, you've, you've incorporated that, it's still a somewhat new reality in Canada. You know, it's only 15 years ago. We have a, we've had an important turnover amongst members of parliament as well in Canada in the last 15 years. Uh, so to, to be frank, because we are in the professional circle, most members of parliament have not reflected that much about those issues and my role versus their role. Uh, it, it, it's still novel uh, and it still takes place each time there is a problem. Basically. 
we have to reassess the, 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 the to communicate with the MPs involved what what our role is and what what their privileges are and so on and so forth to, to we, we're walking a fine line of course of which we have to be always conscious uh, so as not to infringe the privileges of parliament and its members it, it's a very serious matter as far as I'm concerned which I'm responsible to ensure we never do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I mean, just taking that a little bit further it, here in the UK, uh, this committee uh, is always anxious to see that incoming members of parliament uh, get a proper training and understanding of the standard system that they work under. Is there uh, any formal system as far as your new members are concerned? And does that work with, with the parties or independently of the political processes? After each general election, we uh, we are part of a group of uh, people who uh, provide training to MPs, new and not so new MPs, people who may have been re-elected. Uh, we have people who come back after an absence of a few years. So everybody's invited to a general training session that lasts several days at which we have a role to play. And we also offer to the caucuses periodically every year or so, I offer to uh, each caucus of each of the four or five political recognized political parties face to face where uh, MPs can ask questions basically and can have a discussion on pointed subjects such as recusals and con government contracts and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Uh, I, yep. think I've let my, I think I've let my enthusiasm to pursue that subject uh, trespass on uh, other questions. I apologize for that. And I'm That's happy to hand over to Manisha. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Stanok. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Dion. Um, may I ask you, I had some questions similarly around uh, how you promote your um, conflict of interest codes, etc. But could I ask you, uh, just to go back to a previous comment you made, how would, so in, in the UK, uh, the codes are not all laid down in statute. Um, uh, I wondered what you think the impact um, would be on your role if your code wasn't laid down in statute and could be amended by the government or by the executive? It was our situation up until, until uh, 2006 when the Conflict of Interest Act was, was adopted. Until then, it was a code. It was a uh, code adopted by a government and uh, it did not require any, uh, it did not have any parliamentary sanction and did not require any parliamentary approval for, for in order to change. And the impact was that it, the fact that we have a statute now gives a clear perception that it is a mo much more serious matter, that it's not a purely internal, we would like to do things this way matter, but rather it's the law of the land, basically, and there are consequences. Uh, there is, uh, for instance, uh, judicial review accessible. The Federal Court of Appeal has jurisdiction to uh, review my decisions. If somebody who has standing disagrees, for instance, with one of my conclusions. So it's a much more serious affair, if you wish. It takes it outside of the private confines of House of Commons or government itself. Thank you. And it, and that, Important psychological impact, I think, the fact that it's the law of the land. And and are you are you aware of say political parties doing their bit to ensure that there is adherence to the code and and to delivery of high standards? I've had uh, numerous instances where I was able to glean very clearly that somebody uh, was taking this seriously in, uh, for instance, the office of the leader of the opposition. Uh, I had the clear feeling that somebody had been assigned to do education within the membership of the caucus. Uh, so, yeah, there are clear signs of people taking it seriously because it is a, when one of the members is found to have contravened the code, it is a somewhat traumatic experience, not only for her or for him, but for the party as a whole. So they are taking preventative steps to avoid trouble in the future. Thank you. Um, I suppose the, the, the other question I had, uh, you mentioned uh, how this 
putting you know putting the code into statute makes it, it basically changes the status of the code and the and the mm. seriousness with which it is regarded what is what is your view about appointment of 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 uh, the you know a commissioner if your commissioner was appointed say by the your successor was appointed by the prime minister how would you how do you think that would impact their ability to do their job my my successor will if it will so the, the appointment of the commissioner is uh, provided for in the Parliament of Canada Act. So it is a statutory foundation. And um, it is the government who appoints me. I, have, I don't think I've discussed this yet clearly, but uh, so what was done in my situation back in 2017, there was a uh, competition announced. So there was a public announcement that the government was looking for the next conflict of interest and in ethics commissioner. And under the Parliament of Canada Act, it's the government who proposes the nomination of a person. The government has a duty to consult with every officially recognized party leader before, before putting the appointment before the House of Commons for adoption of a resolution. So that's how it works, consultation, resolution. But it is at the end of the day, still the government who appoints the commissioner, but not not without any important formalities having been accomplished. So there was a 56, 56 people applied for the position and there was a selection board and there was consultation with the leader of each recognized party. There was a resolution, but not unanimous. I think it was, uh, there was one MP who voted against my appointment. All others voted in favor of it. So I think it's a good system. Uh, so a system that the, the government could not change without amending the, the Parliament of Canada Act. It's there, it's in the statute. And I think it would not be well regarded if any future government would want to change that. Because it gives a certain guarantee of non-partisanship, if you wish. I understand. Thank you. That's incredibly helpful. So I suppose the, the, the question, the, the last question along those lines for us, we, we have in this system some unregulated or, if you will, informal appointments made by ministers or government. Um, do, you have, do you have such instances within your system, unregulated appointments? Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, Recently, I had uh, there's a provision saying that uh, the act any ministerial advisor is governed by the conflict of interest act, uh, irrespective of the form of appointment. So, if there is a clear agreement between you and the minister of X Y Z that they would like you to provide advice, for instance, from time to time on issue X, you would be captured by the act. So, they talked about that in 2006. Anybody who provides advice to a minister, irrespective of tenure, form of appointment, blah, 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 is governed by the Act. Uh, so are there other people who work around ministers and the government without being governed by the Act? Probably there are, you know. And, uh, but the Act does capture probably 99% of the people uh, it wishes to capture. I see. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. And finally, I have one last, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to ask you one other question. You, you administer the Conflict of Interest Code for members in the House of Commons, as you've said. Um, what makes for an effective code of conduct? Hmm. So is, it, is it important for a code to cover all behaviour in detail, or should they be simple and shorter and allow for personal interpretation? What is the impact of either too much complexity or an over-prescriptive set of rules to more simplest, you know, a simpler code? Do you have a view I, on that? I think they've achieved a balance in Canada. They've, they've essentially, it's a, they've listed a, a short, small number of uh, situations. So the rules are, are restricted to uh, you know, the most uh, likely uh, possible manifestations, if you wish, of situations of conflict of interest without trying to foresee every possible scenario under, under the sun. Uh, so it is actually possible for a member of parliament with of reasonable intelligence uh, to, uh, to assimilate th those. So it's, it's, it's not complex. It's, it's written in 
plain language, I would say. And it's actually possible to assimilate what one cannot do and uh, to read the principles as well. So, uh, you know, a member of parliament who wants to abide by the code would only require a few hours of reading. And my advice is to, uh, I've told them that, each year you should sit down, take a couple of hours, go through the code, note any question you may have, give us a call. Uh, you have to pay attention to this thing periodically, uh, uh, but it's not complex. It's not really complex. And uh, there's also uh, something I say, which I, some people don't agree with, but that's okay. If, if you, you're fortunate enough to have a conscience, you should be guided by your conscience as well. And if a, a doubt does arise in your mind as to whether something is appropriate, then give us a call. We'll discuss it. You know? When you give me a call, you achieve a number of things. You basically make the situation. Uh, you consult somebody who is more objective than you are about your own situation. I don't care what the outcome is. You know, I, I will try to assist you in reaching the good outcome. I'm, I'm more objective than you are. I'm supposed to know a little bit more about these things than you do. And uh, number three, you're protected. If I tell you it's fine to do this, I send you an email, then you're protected. I will not investigate you next week because you've done what I said was fine to do last week. So um, that's the advice we give people. It's Because you cannot, you cannot, it's absolutely impossible to predict every possible behavior under the sun. So, so they did stick to the most commonly possible situations. And do you do you, do you share this good practice? Uh, do you I assume you share good practice uh, uh, around the code? Do people take you up on your offer to talk to them informally? Oh yeah, they do. They do. Uh, we have a we have a group of advisors, eight people all together, who spend uh, hours every day talking to MPs or their staff about situations, real situations, people who need to know whether they can do something that uh, they've been asked to do. We do that day in and day out with MPs. That's very good to know. Thank you very much. That's uh, all I MP had. Who ends Thank up, you. An MP who ends up in an investigation usually is an MP who does not consult. Right. Yeah. Right. Good to right. know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, that's extremely helpful. Can I ask you a question which you won't be able to answer, I guess, but you might be able to give us a flavour. Do you think that the existence and the independence of your role commands public confidence in Canada? Do you think it matters to the people of Canada? I'm, uh, I'm not objective, of course. I do uh, pay a great deal of attention to the media, uh, and I sincerely believe that the they think it's a good thing to have an independent person. Who, uh, and each time a report comes out, they, uh, they are able to gauge the independence, if you wish. Uh, there have been situations already in the first three years people were surprised with the verdict. Uh, so yes, I think it, it, it does provide something useful in order to rebuild or continue to build credibility of political institutions and the people who work in those political institutions. Thank you very much indeed for your evidence, which is very helpful to us as we consider these issues. And uh, we're very grateful to you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. It was a pleasure and all the best in, in your work. And I will be reading with interest anything that might come out of it.